So I have a question. Um, we were wondering if you could show us your junk. If what? You could show us your junk. Show us what? See, now you're being really mean to me. No, that's I, not nice. That's a good enough. That's a good enough. That's not I've been writing and, and making and producing and playing on music for, you know, like 50 years now. I, I was in this art band. So when we first started writing music and our intentions were very specific and we were, very, we were minimalist on purpose. We, we had to practice reductive synthesis because I had a TAC four track home, home recorder so I could you know, mix four channels and then mix them down and add two more channels. And then that was kind of about it. So, so everything had to be very succinct. And if you were playing a guitar part or you were playing a synth part, you had to do it in one take. It was our, it was our, our philosophy back then. And you, so it made us like, it made us uh, uh, really think about what we were doing and, and you know, put things down on purpose. It's so tempting, and, and it became really tempting once we got access to 24-track machines, uh, then to like, well, that bass sound isn't exactly right. Well, let's double it, you know, put yeah. another bass sound on, or let's add something else. And so we, we got into additive synthesis, and um, I just, I still have a soft spot for, for reductive, I mean, because I, I work now, Nowadays, in my job, I, I do movies, yeah. well, mostly. So I'll, I'll have maybe 150 tracks on a, on a song because I'll have a, uh, like an 80-piece orchestra, 30 or 40-piece choir, and then maybe about 40 uh, synth tracks on top of it. You know, like, like an example would be like the Lego movie. So, so I, I miss those old days where I had six tracks to work with. <laughs> The building, I liked it because it was circular and it used to belong to a plastic surgeon in 1969, that's when it was built. And so it was here for like, when this was Sunset Strip and there was, you know, everybody was just walking out, out front. But it works perfect for me as like just a private studio, which is what it is, because it's got all these little rooms with a circular uh, hallway. So I can start walking and if I forget what it was I was going to do, I just keep going, you know, until I remember where it was I was going, and then I can, then I just stop and can head to that room. I don't know. Every now and then you find something to use that in. And then uh, this one's got a good story. Um, this is an ondioline, which a lot of people are, uh, claim it was the first synth ever made. Um, and I, the way I got it was the interesting story. I was writing Freedom of Choice with Devo. We were working at a, at a storefront that, with a painted window in, a, what, in Hollywood. And next door, Pink Floyd was rehearsing for a tour. And so uh, 
their last day. They set this on top of the trash heap, and I said, what are you guys going to do with that? And they go, we're done with it. Do you want it? And I said, sure. But what's kind of cool about it is that it still has all the, the lettering, so like uh, the crew for Pink Floyd would know how to set up the keyboard uh, on stage. So these are all like the, you could, you could do everything it says here and then have it ready to go for something on Dark Side of the Moon. I think that's what they were touring with back then. This was, is a circuit bent uh, toy drum machine. Oh, it, it actually, how do you make it? I always think of, of modifying sound. I always want to modify instruments. And, and my brother Jim, who was the first drummer in Devo, he's, he ended up not playing drums anymore because he became so obsessed with, with um, circuit bending. It didn't have a name back then. This was like the 70s, you know, mid-70s. There was no such thing as circuit bending yet. But, but we were modifying gear because Jim and I would talk about, well, how do you get the sound of a V2 rocket or a mortar blast? Or how do you make your guitar sound like, uh, I don't want it to sound pretty and, and creamy and like something that um, the Eagles were doing. I wanted it to sound just the opposite of that. Yeah. And, and so when we thought, well, why'd stop there? It's attached to a calculator that has had um, its internal guts replaced with oscillators. Um, and uh, this light source, what did the, it had a, a, a strobe light that, that added a tremolo effect to it somehow. Oh, yeah. And um, Boogie Boy did play this uh, um, like for a couple shows in a row. And then at the second show, it didn't really start right away and it took him too long to get it going. <laughs> and everybody in the band, they're like going, it's a beautiful world, and then they're, come on, Boogie, do your solo, and then finally they said, okay, stop bringing that thing out on stage. <laughs> so I brought most of the Devo tapes. These are like um, our studio tapes. This is the last of the original Boogie Boy masks from Canton, Ohio. They all melted. I had, I had found about... 18 of them, and these, these, <laughs> this is what happened to Boogie Boy. Here's our first, here's the reference lacquers from our first uh, album in Germany. Yep, that was it. Brian Eno and and Devo, we were all sitting around in a room somewhere in Cologne, Germany, cutting that thing. I have a bunch of odd tapes like that. I have one. I used to live with Iggy Pop for a while out here in uh, Malibu, and uh, Bob Casali and I, because we had nowhere to, to stay at the time. And so Devo used to rehearse in his living room, and I have a tape somewhere in this stuff where Iggy comes home one day and, and he's kind of crazy and he comes over and he grabs the mic from my hand because he knew all our songs and he starts singing uh, like Praying Hands and something else with us. He, but he's singing in German. Somehow he had some version of the lyrics in German. So I'm, I'm going to get it out and see if he was making up His phrases or if it was really, if he really knew German. Electrophostus. I can't remember what that does. Deluxe memory, man, I, you probably know all those kind of things. Yeah, woman tone, and when she lights up, then you know you've, you've hit the, the sweet spot, I guess. Uh, this one here has like a, like a sequencer on it. The original console that Devo used to mix our first single in Akron. No, it's not, it's, I don't know, it's just a toy that showed up and it's never, it showed up and it never, there's a speaker cranker right here. Yeah. You guys know what that thing is. To me, Stompbox is one of the things that's great about them is they're 
what gives an artist the opportunity to put his personality on the sound that he's working on. Because uh, especially with, on synths, they're really important uh, to me, I think. Because synths, I could put like a ring modulator on something that I could control and I knew how to control that. So uh, I just thought of the, the um, I, I ended up thinking of keyboards in a different way in, in that point of time. It was, it was a easy way to think about how do you own a sound or how do you modify something. Yeah, you're you're on another planet once you step on a on the on the switch on on some of those things, and that's I like that. It's like if you want to go to that other planet, that's great. If you don't, you can just stay and strum away and John Denver your life along. You know, <laughs> once again, now now this is over. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you so thanks for coming to visit, you guys. <laughs>